Good evening, everyone. I'm Matthew Williams, Chief Technology Officer of Faraday Grid. As you've heard, we have something very exciting and special, and I'm happy to be able to share that with you tonight after such a long journey. In order for the grid to be capable of doing what we're asking of it, there must be a fundamental shift. That's why our technology is not a simple improvement on existing designs. It's not a new transformer. It's an entirely new technology that operates in a unique way. The Faraday grid is enabled by the Faraday exchanger, a device which is capable of controlling voltage, controlling power factor, maintaining system frequency, and removing all harmonics. These are four key characteristics required to enable a high penetration of renewable energy into our grid in a reliable and safe way. Before we do some live demonstrations tonight, I'd like to give you a brief insight into how we came up with this solution. Engineering today can tend to more, to more towards what we would call design by precedence, where solutions are discovered by looking at what's been done in the past and trying to improve upon that. We took the exact opposite approach and looked at what the grid needs to be in the future in order to achieve our goals. Using our design by rationalized constraint methodology, we were able to map all of the constraints that act on the electricity grid. These include things like the laws of physics, economics, environmental considerations, and policy and regulation. Once we'd mapped all of these constraints and how they interact with each other, what we'd actually done is defined a solutions envelope. By definition, the best answer must be within this space, but then rather than presupposing what the right answer should be based on what's been done before, we used advanced engineering techniques backed by simulation in order to define what the Faraday exchange should be, but more importantly, to discover systemic optimality for the electricity grid. So tonight we have a Faraday exchanger in front of you, which we, we have connected to a live test rig. There we go. So this system that we're operating uh, can supply varying loads uh, and generation in order for us to test in real world conditions. So the first test tonight we'll be doing is voltage control. So voltage in the grid is important to maintain a reliable and efficient system. If our voltage goes too high, we risk damaging equipment and blowing out the lights, and if it goes too low, we'll get blackouts. So you can see on the screen here that we have an input voltage of 50 volts and an output of 24 volts. Now, this device here is actually a 230 to 110 device. However, due to ELV safety considerations, we're just operating at 50 volts tonight. So we can see with our control system turned on, as we drop our input voltage to, say, 45 volts, our output stays steady. If we were to turn our control off, we would see that our output voltage would drop in line with the drop that we had on the input. So this is a dynamic system. So what happens if we introduce a pulse into the waveform? We can see the disturbance on the input is being passed onto the output of the exchanger. However, if we turn our control back on, we'll see that our output goes back to a steady 24 volts. Our device has great capability in this, and we can even deal with uh, excessive random voltage noise coming in on the input and still maintain a clean output. As you can see, that looks pretty amazing. The second test tonight is power factor. So power factor is the ratio of power delivered to power actually consumed. Ideally, we want this ratio to be one, and uh, sorry, we want it to be one, and if it drops below one, we've got an inefficient system. So at the moment, we've got a power factor of one on the input and one on the output. So power factor is a bit different. It's determined by the load on the system. So if we have an electric motor come online, the system might, on the output, see a drop in power factor to 0.9. And you can see, with the control turned off, acting like a transformer, on the input, we get a drop of the power factor to 0.9. That inefficiency is passed upstream. However, if we turn our control system on, 
we can see that our input power factor goes back to 1, despite it being 0.9 on the output still. This particular device here has the capability to do this down to a 0.8 power factor on the load. There we go, still maintaining 1. The third test tonight will be harmonics. So one of the issues with power systems has always been maintaining a clean waveform in the system. When we get noise on this waveform, we introduce power quality issues and inefficiencies. So we use AC power. So you can see here we have on the input side, on the left, we have an AC sine wave. And on the output, we have a nice clean sine wave as well. With our control turned off, if we add some harmonic distortion to the input, this will get passed down to the down to the secondary. There we go. However, if we turn our control system on and act as a Faraday exchanger, we're able to remove this noise from the waveform. As I said earlier, this is a dynamic system. So on top of this, we can start to add in some random noise and really see this thing in action. There we go. We have a dynamically varying input voltage waveform, and you can see our output is remaining nice and steady. So as we've said, the Faraday Exchanger as a device is capable of doing all three of these things simultaneously. So if we bring back up our voltage and our power factor, you'll see here that the Faraday Exchanger is controlling power flow to maintain optimum system performance in real time. You'll, an interesting point is you'll have noticed that tonight in this demonstration, we've been able to turn our control system on and off. This is entirely by design. The reason being is when the exchanger is in an electricity grid, if there is a failure of the control system for any reason, the Faraday exchanger will default back to acting like a transformer. This means we're not introducing any risk into the grid and we're entirely safe. We're the only device that can do this. So, Faraday Exchanger it truly is a drop-in replacement for the transformer in electricity grids. There's no additional hardware, there's no network connections, and there's no additional complexity. So that's the Faraday Exchanger. But as I said at the start, our intention was not to design an optimum Faraday Exchanger, but to, to design an optimal electricity grid. So what happens when we put the Faraday exchanger in the grid? Unfortunately, the museum wouldn't let us bring in an entire electricity grid this evening, but we have done many, many simulations, and I'd like to share the results with you now. So let's start small. Let's start with a low-voltage network. We can think of this as an area of Edinburgh. In this network, we've got some rural loads, some residential, commercial, and industrial. So it's a good representation of a normal area of the grid. In this simulation, we've got about 10,000 houses. What we've been able to show is that using existing grid infrastructure and transformers, you can integrate about 20% renewable energy into this low voltage grid before you start having issues with stability. However, when we replace the transformer with the Faraday exchanger and do nothing else, we're able to double the amount of renewable energy into the grid. That's truly amazing. But that's just a small grid. What happens when we go bigger? What happens when we expand to an entire city or a country or even an entire continent? We've modeled 77 different high voltage networks, ranging from a small four bus network all the way up to an 18,400 bus network. To put it in context, that's the, the actual EU grid that we've modeled. We've run these, um, these models under many, many different conditions, and in total have run over 10 million simulations. What we've been able to prove is a number of things. Firstly, at scale, we are able to double the amount of renewable energy that can be safely integrated into the grid. When we do this for the UK grid, that is enough renewable energy for about 12.3 million homes. That's roughly half of the UK. We've also been able to show that we can decrease losses in the system by 7%. That gives us enough free power 
to power 660,000 homes, or roughly 2.5% of the UK. This is completely for free, as we're just getting less losses. The third thing we've been able to show is we can reduce the need for balancing services in the grid. So at the moment, National Grid and others procure these balancing services in order to maintain stability within the grid. As we know, Faraday Grid can help do this, and so we can reduce the amount of balancing service required by 40%. That's a total saving of 350 million pounds a year, which can be passed on directly to consumers. The final thing I'd like to share with you is that we've, we've been able to show that we'll be able to increase the capacity of our existing grids. We can, do, uh, we can do this by 25% by rolling out the Faraday Exchanger. What this means is that using our existing grid infrastructure, we can get 25% more power through the grid without the need for any expensive capital upgrades. As we continue to use more and more power, this opens up a lot, a lot of possibilities. But then we thought, what happens if we take it a step further? What happens if we put more Faraday exchanges within the grid? We took this to the extreme and put a Faraday exchanger on every single bus within the network. And when we did this, we were able to put 100 times more energy through the existing grid. That's truly amazing and can open up all sorts of possibilities for us in the future. So tonight, I've only spoken about the Faraday exchanger in terms of electricity grids. But as a device, it's applicable to many, many other things. Two that I'd like to share with you tonight are wind turbines and electric vehicles. So wind power is getting more and more penetration in our grids, and that's a great thing, but we know that it's starting to introduce problems into the future. The Faraday exchange applied to the output stage of a wind turbine can replace expensive electrical equipment, reducing the cost of building a wind turbine, but can also improve the quality of the power that the wind turbine produces and allow it to put more energy into the grid. With electric vehicles, the exchanger, a much smaller one obviously, is applicable in the electric vehicle itself, improving efficiency and increasing range. But perhaps more interestingly is when we start putting exchanges in the grid charging points. The UK and Scotland in particular have very ambitious targets for electric vehicles, and this is going to have a huge impact on the way that electricity grids uh, have power flows both in terms of quantity and direction. Having Faraday exchanges in the charging points as part of a wider Faraday grid will dramatically increase the capability and flexibility of our grid to handle these power flows. So I hope tonight I was able to give you a brief insight into the capability and performance of the Faraday Exchanger and the Faraday Grid. There's no doubt that a new energy era is upon us, and perhaps up until this point, we've been somewhat unprepared for the challenges that this brings upon us. But the Faraday Exchanger and the Faraday Grid give us a way to have an electricity system with much more renewable energy in a reliable, affordable, efficient, and most importantly, a safe way. Thank you.